one bloodbath gate the hoax that has taken over the media and hopes to take over your mind and your vote two charging teenagers seventh graders for a crime for what is admittedly very very vile speech with our lunch break panel today here on the will kane show and three the dallas cowboys f in free agency and perhaps an f for the future of the franchise It is the Will Cain Show, streaming live at foxnews.com and on the Fox News YouTube channel, the Fox News Facebook page, and always on demand wherever you get your audio entertainment. Listen on podcast at Apple, Spotify, or at Fox News Podcast. Just go hit subscribe, and the latest episodes of the Will Cain Show will show up in your stream. If you like watching it on video, head on over to Will Cain Show on YouTube. It's in the description right under this live stream, and you can hit subscribe to catch past exclusive interviews, YouTube shorts, and new content from The Will Cain Show. Just subscribe at YouTube, Will Cain Show. I'm back from spring break. It's been a nice little getaway last week to the Caribbean. I went down to Turks and Caicos with the in-laws, with the family, a bunch of teenage boys, and had a good time. As is always the case, the most fun part for me is competition. Vacation for me is competition. When we go away in the summer, I love playing pickleball. I love playing golf. I'm horrific. I think I lost seven balls into the sands and waters of Turks and Caicos through the first three holes playing golf. But I like getting after it. I like competing. I like the endorphins flowing. I like spike ball. That's what we did down there on the beach. Me taking on all the teenagers and talking trash. They were terrible. I was the champion of spike ball. But I did come away with a couple of takeaways I wanted to share with you. First of all, it's gorgeous, as so many of you know. Whoever's been to the Caribbean. I mean, the turquoise waters, the sand beaches, it's gorgeous. But, you know, I wanted to tie this in, an observation I had over spring break, to something that was going on in the news cycle. And something that I'm increasingly believing is not just the case of xenophobia, but an accurate observation of the world. And that is, it's almost, almost Always better in America. I love traveling abroad because uh, I'm, I'm driven by exploration and curiosity. I like going to Spain or Italy or I've never been to South America because I would like to just see and learn about different places and different people and different history. I always fall down the rabbit hole, you know, using Wikipedia to learn the history of wherever I'm going. And I love that part of an exotic vacation. You know, I spent some time trying to figure out the history of Turks and Caicos, which is pretty fascinating. 87% of the population of those islands is black, almost all of it obviously tied to the slave trade. Before 1500, it was populated by the Taino Indians, almost all of which were eradicated by disease with the arrival of the Europeans. And what was the slave trade? Why was there economy on these islands that are low-slung, desertish, if not beautiful? They were harvesting salt. And I love figuring out, you know, the history of an area and why it has any element of significance. I inevitably fell down the rabbit hole of piracy. I love the idea of pirates marauding around the Caribbean, pulling into various coves, building pirate caves. We spent most of it, me and my 12-year-old, searching for a rumored pirate cave down the cliffs. But what I will say is most of the Caribbean is luxury surrounded by poverty. I'm not saying every place, and I'm not the most well-traveled, but I think most beach locations around the world have developed into luxury surrounded by poverty. At the same time I was there was the news event of the chaos and destruction, yet again, of Haiti. A gang leader named Barbecue has taken over Haiti. It's descended into violence and rumors of cannibalism on the streets of Port-au-Prince. And the local newspaper in Turks and Caicos, which comes out weekly, um, the local newspaper was warning against an influx of Haitians onto that and other islands across the Caribbean. And what would they do? How would they enforce their borders? Oh, yes, 
open conversation. Nobody yelling about xenophobia. Nobody saying, oh my God, how dare you talk about Haiti as though it's an s-hole country. You'll remember Donald Trump once talked about the kind of people flooding into our country from Venezuela or from Haiti or from various third world countries around the world and described them as s-hole countries. That made, that required that everyone, not just in mainstream media, but in comedy, to once again paint Donald Trump as a racist or a xenophobe. But no one ever really took the time to ask, is he accurate? Is he right? If not blunt, if not crude, is he not correct? It is the truth that the history of Haiti is one of pure instability, closer resembling chaos, rampant violence. And as a result, you have an island community with an incredibly low standard of living, a culture that has not flourished in progress. And when refugees or criminals are either let free to immigrate or seek refuge in a greater country, it's not inaccurate to say these people are coming to our country from one that is significantly below our cultural, technological, societal standard of living. What Donald Trump would describe as an asshole. Now, the people of Turks and Caicos, the people of the Dominican Republic, the people of various islands across the Caribbean, they certainly are talking about you can't build a wall, except they have done that in Dominican Republic. You police the seas. You make sure there aren't boats coming over. Barbecue and other gang leaders have unleashed thousands of criminals from the prisons in Haiti. It's one of the first things they did. They stormed the Bastille. They stormed the prison and flooded the streets with criminals. How long until those criminals or refugees are in boats headed to Turks and Caicos, are headed east over to the Dominican Republic, are headed to the shores of Florida. Once you travel exotically outside of this country, you see that everything that is common sense but domestically described as racist or xenophobic is actually the human condition not just of tribalism or nation state building, but on protecting a way of life, a standard of living. And you saw that. I saw that last week on spring break. And so what I would tell you is while most beach locations across the world are luxury surrounded by poverty, I'm a bit of a homer when it comes to Hawaii. It's simply better, safer, cleaner, better infrastructure when it is in America. We have built something here worth preserving. We have built something here worth growing. We have built something here worth pride you can go to some place like Hawaii and it's clean and it's beautiful and it's safe. And quite honestly, it's America. Maybe it's not a competition like spike ball, but I'm just here to tell you, I'm not the most well-traveled person in the world, but I've seen Italy. I've seen Greece. I've seen Spain. I've seen the queen in her damn undie pants. And it's better right here in America. From bloodbaths to criminal charges for children, it's good to be back with you here on The Will Cain Show. I've missed you. I'm ready to get into it today. We've got a lunch break panel coming up with Bobby Burak of Outkick and others, and we will be breaking it all down. What did we miss? Aaron Rodgers. What did we miss? NFL free agency. But what is taking over the minds, and hopefully in their estimation, your vote in America? A bloodbath. Story number one. Donald Trump gave a rally this weekend in his race for the presidency in Ohio. He took to the stage and he talked about the EV push from Joe Biden. There's expected to be news this week where there's new regulations pushing the car industry further towards electrical vehicles. Part of that push, which there doesn't seem to coordinate with any consumer demand, would have a devastating effect on the American auto industry, so says Donald Trump. And when he took that stage, he described the future. He described 
the auto industry and what it would look like under Joe Biden. Listen. Let me tell you something to China. If you're listening, President Xi, and you and I are friends, but he understands the way I deal, those big monster car manufacturing plants that you're building in Mexico right now, and you think you're going to get that, you're going to not hire Americans, and you're going to sell the cars to us now, we're going to put a 100 percent tariff on every single car that comes across the line, and you're not going to be able to sell those cars. If I get elected, now, if I don't get elected, it's going to be a bloodbath for the whole. That's going to be the least of it. It's going to be a bloodbath for the country. That'll be the least of it. But they're not going to sell those cars. It'll be a bloodbath for the auto industry. It'll be a bloodbath for the country. That'll be the least of it. He's talking there about Chinese imports built in Mexico and the effect on the auto industry. I've had similar recent conversations with car dealerships and owners of car dealerships about the effect of the electrical vehicle push on what it would do to the auto industry. Either way, whether or not it's Chinese imports or the push for EVs, you are potentially looking at a bloodbath for the American auto industry. But that clip was clipped out of context. It has been splashed across the internet. Starting on Sunday and Bleeding into this morning on Monday, that clip has been turned into the following headlines. Take a look at this from news sources from NBC to Rolling Stone. Trump says there will be a bloodbath if he loses the election. CBS News in Ohio rally. Trump says there will be a bloodbath if he loses the election. Rolling Stone. Trump says there will be a bloodbath and elections will not happen if he loses in 2024. CNN, Trump warns of bloodbath for the auto industry if, and country if he loses the election. CNN at least putting in the context that it includes the auto industry. NPR, Trump says some migrants are not people and warns of bloodbath if he loses. Trump was referencing people like the murderer of Lake and Riley, that they were monsters, not people. And he was talking about the auto industry when he was referencing a bloodbath. But the media immediately ran with this as though Trump was celebrating the potential and laying the groundwork for another January 6th for political violence, that he was calling for a literal bloodbath if he loses the election. Here's a great example of what was taking place across the media. And as it merged with politics, former House Speaker Nancy Pelosi. He's even predicting a bloodbath. What does that mean? He's going to exact a bloodbath? There's something wrong here. How um, respectful I am of the American people and their goodness. But how much more do they have to see from him to understand that this isn't what our country is about? Now, this, at first blush, is insanity. It's insanity. How can someone be this stupid? How can someone be this willfully obtuse, in the words of Shawshank Redemption? How can someone be so mistaken? But first blush is incorrect because this is not stupidity. It's not even insanity. It is purposeful manipulation. Yes, obviously of a clip taken out of context, but purposeful manipulation of your mind. And the purposeful manipulation of your mind is to motivate you by fear to vote. Vote, vote, vote against Donald Trump. Now, I wanted to step back, as I always would like to do, and make sure that I don't straw man but instead I steal, man, the argument for anyone who saw that clip and hears another January 6th. A steel man puts forth their best argument. What is it how we can understand what they're trying to say? Is there inside of that some hidden kernel of truth? I don't intend to be Don Quixote burning down, tilting my lance at windmills and burning down a field of straw men. I want to take down the best version of your opponent. The best I can tell is that Trump in that speech spoke, as he often does, stream of consciousness in a bit of a non sequitur. He's talking about the auto industry and said there will be a bloodbath. And then he says that'll be the least of it. It'll be a bloodbath for our country. He is talking about, I believe, 
while one could say, whoa, he expanded it on the auto industry, he didn't limit it to the auto industry. He clearly said that'll be the least of it. He's talking about more than simply the auto industry. One could try to say, oh, he's talking about the country. And I would say to that, yes, he does expand upon the limitation of the auto industry. But I think it reads pretty clearly that he's talking about A, the economy at large beyond the auto industry, and there would be a bloodbath, and B, the country at large, be it our culture, our economy, our inflation, our taxes, the loss of common sense, would be a bloodbath if he loses the election. I have a hard time steelmanning my way into understanding how they're saying he's asking for a bloodbath, that he's asking for insurrection, he's asking for January 6th, should he lose the election. I have a hard time understanding how they arrive at that phrase in that context, even with those non sequiturs, even with that stream of consciousness, is a call for political violence. Now, in steel manning this argument and trying to understand them and weigh it against the potential that it's simply Trump derangement syndrome or willful manipulation of your mind, I have to take into account that most of the people hyperventilating and yelling about political violence are the very same people that sold me the lie about very fine people in the wake of Charlottesville, Virginia. There is a decent chance that some of you listening, and there is a greater than decent chance that anyone not listening to the Will Cain show, still today believes that Donald Trump called neo-Nazis very fine people. But in order for them to believe that, they can only exist and live in the emanations of words, the repetition of rumor. Throw a rock into a canyon and hear the echoes. They don't ever hear original source material. They hear the repetition of rumor. What did Trump say that day? And this one blows your mind when you revisit source footage. Trump said in the wake of Charlottesville that there were very fine people on both sides of that debate, talking about those that don't want to see our statues torn down. He then goes into, would you take down a statue of George Washington? In that case, remember after Charlottesville, they were taking down statues of Robert E. Lee. He said George Washington was a slave owner. How about Thomas Jefferson? He says, how do you feel about Thomas Jefferson? In that moment in 2017, he's actually, as is often the case, to be quite honest with Donald Trump, He's prescient. He's a fortune teller. He's looking into the future. Because here we sit today in 2024, some seven years later, and of course they've attacked George Washington. Yes, they have gone after Thomas Jefferson. And he's asking, would you go after them? And he's recognizing there are very fine people on both sides of the debate about how to address revisiting our history, taking down statues. Then Trump says, very specifically, I'm not talking about the neo-Nazis. I'm not talking about white supremacists. Go back and look at the source video from that time. Look at it. He specifically says, I am not talking about neo-Nazis. I am not talking about white supremacists. He says there's very fine people in the argument to take down the statues. And then he says, but I'm not talking about the people in black. He's referencing Antifa. He's talking about the goodwill debate on both sides of this issue of how you deal with parts of our past that we've evolved morally beyond and rewriting our history. And he's accepting from that. He's complimenting both sides of the debate, calling them very fine people. And he's accepting from that Antifa and white supremacists and neo-Nazis. But that is turned into Trump calls Nazis very fine people. The opposite of what he said. How do they justify that to themselves? How do they get away with it? By clipping the very first 10 seconds. There's very fine people on both sides of this situation. Before he gets to the part where he says, I'm not talking about the neo-Nazis. I'm not talking about the white supremacists. This is what the media has become so adept at. And I know that I'm media. This is what the legacy media has become so adept at. And I know that I'm legacy media. But in the end, I'm Will Kane, And I'm going to do my best to share with you the truth. I'm going to be real and be honest. That's my pledge to be authentic. To do my best to search for the truth and be honest about my biases. I don't get dictates down from on high. I'm not told what to say. The How do they get away, the media, the legacy media, with that? By clipping things out of context. They have to be 
not stupid, not insane, at a minimum willfully obtuse, again in the words of Shawshank Redemption, or manipulating your mind. Zoom in. Zoom in to the very first few words and then lie about the greater takeaway. Zoom in to his call for a bloodbath and lie about the greater takeaway of the auto industry, the greater economy, perhaps even the country, by suggesting it's not a prediction for the state of the country, but a call for political violence. Now, how does this work into manipulating your mind? Here's how. Those headlines I read to you earlier from across the media landscape, they're then echoed. If you do a Google search on Trump and bloodbath, you'll see how big tech plays a role. The top headlines, the entirety almost of the first page will be Trump calls for bloodbath in the wake of an election. Google represents 97% of the search market. If you want to see the truth, if you want to see full context, you have to dig. You have to work. You have to do things like listen to The Will Cain Show. Now, now that tech is helping formulate the minds, a mass psychosis, a mass formation psychosis, politicians pounce. They use the opportunity. We saw from Nancy Pelosi. How about this from Hawaii, from a senator from Hawaii? He immediately told the media how to report this. He tweeted the following. Brian Schatz, headline writers, don't outsmart yourself. Just do, quote, Trump promises bloodbath if he doesn't win election. That's a government official telling the media how to promote misinformation, how to write the headline. And by the way, how about an administration who has championed the fight against misinformation? They even looked to put in a board in to help, you know, advance their goals of censorship in advancing their goals of a mass formation psychosis in advancing their goals of manipulating your mind. How does that work for the administration who's fought misinformation? Well, of course, to perpetuate misinformation. The Biden administration tweeted the, the following, the Biden campaign. And then Joe Biden himself this morning, Monday morning, tweeted, it's clear this guy wants another January 6th. He's referencing Donald Trump's speech from Ohio. He's taken the bloodbath and says, it's a call for political violence. It's a call for another January 6th. And then the money line. And then... The poker player puts his cards on the table and says, I'm going to play my cards face up so that you can see. He then says, after saying it's clear this guy wants another January 6th, but the American people are going to give him another resounding electoral defeat in November. Play the cards face up. Let them know exactly what you're doing. Lie. They don't care. Too many want the lie. The rest will be manipulated by headlines and Google. Lie, bloodbath, hoax. By the way, various Biden officials went on MSNBC and said, this is, he's calling for a bloodbath. And in order to do that, they referenced other hoaxes that they've already permitted, already perpetuated. They talk about January 6th being an insurrection. They talk about January 6th being deadly. The only person that died as a result of that day in January 6th was one of the rioters, Ashley Babbitt. It was deadly only to one of the people involved in that riot. It's not as the hoax is perpetuated that law enforcement officers died on January 6th as a result of the actions of January 6th. Support your hoax with the evidence of other hoaxes. So play the cards face up. Lie. Perpetuate the hoax. Instill fear. Make you afraid. There'll be an insurrection. It's a move towards authoritarianism. It's the last election in America. We must save democracy. And then marshal your fear for your vote. Joe Biden says the American people will not allow him to do so and will give him a resounding defeat in November. That is the poker player's hand. That's the cards. Brazenly lie. Never let go of the hoax. Double down. Triple down. And that's what was done this morning on MSNBC on the show Morning Joe. Triple down. Listen. He's talking about a bloodbath for America. It's laid out in the terms of it. And these idiots uh, on Twitter, uh, these idiots 
uh, on, 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 on cable news, these idiots on Sunday shows going, well, I have our presidents, you know, he was talking only about the auto industry and this is one more, it's just bullshit. Let me say that at 6.15 a.m., it's just bullshit. He knew what he was doing. We're not stupid. Americans aren't stupid. He was talking about a bloodbath. He was talking about a literal bloodbath, says the show of Trump derangement syndrome. But it's not. It's not simply mistaken. It's not simply insanity. It's not simply Trump derangement syndrome. It's willful. It's taking it out of context. It's been done before on dozens of occasions. It's being done now, and it will be done again. Get ready for the next seven months. They're playing their cards face up, and all of it is designed to manipulate your mind so that they can manipulate your vote. Bloodbath. Can you charge, should you charge, a 13 or 14-year-old for vile, vile speech? That, plus Aaron Rodgers for VP, Aaron Rodgers as a conspiracy theorist. Let's get into what I missed over spring break with our lunch break panel. That's coming up next on The Will Cain Show. Fox News Podcast Network. I'm Emily Campagno, and this is the Fox True Crime Podcast. And I had nothing to do with her disappearance, but people still accuse me of it. I sit down with the people who lived the nightmares. I was in shock. I was just devastated. The investigators who tirelessly worked on the case. I feel for their families, and I really hope that they can catch this guy. Bringing you closer to the story than you ever thought possible. Listen and follow now at foxnewspodcasts.com or wherever you get your podcasts. Today is just such a special day. The XFL and the USFL merge together to create one powerful spring football league called the UFL. Here we go. These players are going to play hard-nosed, intense football, passionate football. Every play matters. Touchdown. They got one shot. They're going to ball out. How about this? Wow. Incredible. Spring football yeah. is here to stay. The UFL season kicks off March 30th on Fox and ABC. I'm Dana Perino, co-host of The Five and co-anchor of America's Newsroom. Join me for my brand new podcast, Perino on Politics. Listeners of Everything Will Be Okay will gravitate toward this podcast, too. Every Monday, I'm going to talk to people I trust in politics as they tell me what they're seeing and thinking in the 2024 election cycle. As they prep me to cover the upcoming election, they'll prep you, the voters, too. Make sure you subscribe to this series on foxnewspodcast.com or wherever you download podcasts and leave a rating and review. I told you my favorite thing about spring break. Sprang break was competition. A little spike ball, a little golf. Well, I competed this morning. As many of you faithful listeners of The Will Cain Show know, one of my New Year's resolutions was four physical challenge in 2024. I just completed the first, a 5K row. After nine weeks of training on the C2 rowing machine, I competed this morning. I registered my time. Was I victorious or was I a loser? I will let you know in tomorrow's episode of The Will Kane Show. But for now, streaming live at foxnews.com and on the Fox News YouTube channel and the Fox News Facebook page is our lunch break panel. Let's bring in Bobby Burak. He's a columnist at outkick.com. He covers culture, politics, sports, media. You can follow him on X at Burak Bobby underscore and Andrew Heaton. He's a comedian. He's the host of the Political Orphanage podcast. And adults are talking with Andrew Heaton. Show on free people. He's also an ex at Mighty Heaton. What's up, guys? Hey, happy Will, spring what's break. Going on? I, I applaud what's your up? physical prowess. I look like a pregnant meerkat when I take my shirt off. I am very skinny and out of shape compared to you. So kudos. Really, Andrew, you're skinny fat. Yeah, well, yeah, I, I'm, I'm like, that's why I wear suits, because I, I, I look like a scarecrow, and then I hit, like, 38 and started putting on this, like, weird, like, one inch of blubber, so it's, it's, it's very disconcerting. It's not horrible if I'm fully clothed, but in a bathing suit, less so. <laughs> Wait, Will, well, young Bobby is, here is in the prime of his life. You, I get a text saying, 
how pale I look because you're, you're always coming off some vacation, whether it's Hawaii or Florida, and you're all tan. Uh, we got to time this yeah. better where I get you pre-vacation, not post-vacation. Well, we could do that. Um, I could give you a couple other tips. Move out of Michigan, <laughs> A. Uh, B, take a vacation. Or C, do the television secret of get yourself a little makeup and bronzer, Bobby. And I'm not going to even lie. I mean, everyone listening can know. But we're going to be real. There's a little makeup every weekend on Fox and Friends, and you can add a little tan. By the way, Bobby, you're in the prime of your life. You're in your 20s, not like Andrew and myself. So yeah, this is it, man. This is when you got to get after it. It's yeah. after this, buddy. It, it's I, I've I've figured it out. My energy is all over the place. I don't control it. My performance is unpredictable. Um, so you need to start doing what you're going to do right now. Mm-hmm. Get after it, Bobby. So I have a question for both of you guys, and I mean this sincerely. So guys get a lot of energy when they're like 16. They finally get a car, and they feel like they're on top of the world. But I had heard recently the midlife crisis is actually just as energizing. So do you think you have more energy when you're 45 through 50, when you go through that crisis, or 25 through 30, when you're stuck right in the middle of those two demographics? You have more energy when you're 25 to 30. You don't, you don't get, the, the reason that you get a charge during your midlife crisis is that you just bought a Porsche and you left your wife to date your secretary. That is energizing, but it's not anything biochemical. It's just the dumb decisions you make. But the, the nice thing That's that you can the, look forward, you can look forward to go. is um, I, I have found my, my sloping, declining testosterone levels to actually be quite pleasant. Uh, because what, when you're 26, <laughs> you just want to like climb stuff and scream. Like go to yeah. like if you drive by a college campus, what are the guys doing? They're climbing stuff and screaming. That's all men want to do until they're yeah. about 28. And so like now, like it's just it's it's I'm about where I want to be. It's a level of of placidity that I'm comfortable with, where I'm still industrious and I still get things done. But I I'm not I don't know I don't have a weird drive to go out and like fight and skirt chase and stuff. Okay, I, right. well noted. Well, what I would say, Andrew, is you've described the 1980s midlife crisis, like date the secretary and get the Porsche is 1980s. The, the, the modern day midlife crisis is what I'm going through, where it's like, oh, I need to get in shape. I need to do some things. I need to climb that mountain. That's that's the modern day midlife crisis. And all I'm saying is it's harder than than doing these kind of things at your age, Bobby. But Andrew is 100 percent correct. You do not have more energy. You might have more yeah. inspiration, but you don't have more energy than, than as a young man. Hey, let's get into what I might have missed when I was on spring break with both of you guys. So first of all, I want to dive into Aaron Rodgers. There's two levels to the Aaron Rodgers story, and suspiciously, they came out at the same time. The first is that uh, he's on a short list, reportedly, for Robert F. Kennedy Jr. for vice president. The second is that at the same time, there's this report from CNN, Pamela Brown and Jake Tapper, that a- Aaron Rodgers is a conspiracy theorist who denies the reality of Sandy Hook. Now, from what I could tell as I read it poolside on spring break, this came down to two sources. And I'll go to you first, Bobby, as somebody who covers the media here. It was the yeah. reporter herself, Pamela Brown, and an anonymous source. I, I don't know. Th- like, reporters themselves being the source is simply me telling you I heard. You know, it's firsthand yeah. account, but it requires me to believe, A, in anonymous sources, and B, in CNN. Yeah, this <clears throat> this read to me like the anonymous source had reached out to Pamela Brown, and she just happened to say, oh, yeah, he told me that, too, 12 years ago at a Kentucky Derby party. That's the way I took it. Look, it was there's no such things as coincidences in media. This was obviously tied to the RFK VP list. This was obviously planted and reported to damage Aaron Rodgers. But it was so bizarre because I think you used to put this phrase better than anybody. You can't disprove a negative. We can't disprove that this didn't happen. And because CNN didn't provide any proof, we're just left believing which side we want to. I didn't take much of that because we have no proof of it. We don't know who this anonymous source is. And Pamela Brown using herself as a source, I've never seen that in journalism to that degree, especially on a story hey, really as quick, consequential Bobby, as this one. I'll go back to you with this, Bobby, because you and I both, I was in sports media, you covered sports media. Yeah. That was enough for most of sports media. Like oh, those course. sources and and that allegation that you can't disprove, 
I mean, I, I watched, and sometimes I get so angry at sports media commentariat reporters yeah. because they are so willing to do um, confirmation bias. Oh, I heard something about somebody that I already didn't like, so that means it's real. Yeah. And they ran with that, man. They, I mean, they ran with he is a pure conspiracy theorist and he's completely irresponsible. I'm not going to say it was the entirety of sports media, but it had the loudest megaphone. Will, Rich Eisen's executive producer said that the New York Jets should cut Aaron Rodgers and the NFL should never sign him again. They called for his NFL career based off these anonymous sources. Insane. Andrew, wh wh by the way, you, you can address that. And also, like, it's pretty interesting to think about. I mean, Robert F. Kennedy Jr.'s VP list, um, I mean, almost everyone is, is, let's put it this way, outside of the central circle of politics. Uh, so I'm down in Austin, Texas. I met RFK Jr. last week. I went to an event that he was at. Uh, he was he was getting interviewed by former head of the ACLU. Um, I was impressed by him. I went in with very low expectations, as I do with anybody that appears to be banking on a family name. Um, and he is somebody that that uh, seemed to me to have a very good grasp of of civil libertarian issues and a inherent understanding that government will abuse whatever power you give to it. Uh, I don't know that I would agree with him on everything, but th there are things that I really liked about him. And the other thing I'll note is that when I went to his campaign event afterwards, he is running a real campaign. And I mentioned that because a lot of the time, third party candidates are are doing a kind of ceremonial trot of ideas that are not in the mainstream, but they're not real campaigns. They're not going to functionally make it. I got the distinct impression that he is actually running for president. He's not just trying to get a book deal or going to do this and then try to segue into an ambassadorship or something. Um, the the two people that are at the top of the list right now uh, are, are Aaron Rodgers and then and Jesse Ventura. I think uh, Aaron Rodgers is a very interesting choice. If I were running as a third party candidate, um, having somebody that is under 90 on the ticket would be pretty good is a good contrast to the two major parties. Uh, uh, Donald Trump and Joe Biden are both older than Bill Clinton. Think about that for a minute. Bill Clinton's younger than the two major party candidates. And I think what you're seeing right now, and you're going to see a lot more of, is an attempt from the two major parties to make uh, everything always a two-way two, two -way race. And you're going to see a an increasing emphasis on how do we intellectually disqualify candidates rather than actually fight them. Uh, we live in a two-party mm -hmm. system that is run by the two-party system, the Republican Party and the Democratic Party don't actually want to compete for your votes. What they want to do is say, listen, we know you don't like us, but at least we're not the other guy. They want to run campaigns based on fear and hatred. And it's easier to do that when you've only got two options and you vote for the lesser of two evils. So when a third party candidate comes in and goes, well, actually, I've got some ideas you might like, that's very threatening to them. And they're going to spend a lot of time and effort um, making them the crazy people so that no one will consider voting for them. Right. Well, that's actually what Donald Trump represented. I mean, while he was under the Republican banner, I mean, let's be real about the policies that he represented. They were a departure from previous Republican politics, and he was an outsider. And because of that, we the entirety of Donald Trump's um, uh, campaign and tenure as president is fighting not just Democrats, but it's fighting every institution in, in American governance, from, from media to, to the intelligence agencies and the Republican Party itself. I mean, the only time he might have had the Republican Party behind him was after he got the nomination in 2016. But even after that, it was a pretty big obstacle towards him. And that's not the cult of personality talking. That's an accurate analysis of someone who existed outside the political spectrum, right? The, the, the binary choice you just provided us, Andrew. So here's what I'd be curious about. Like, what— do you guys think we go right back to standard old politics after Donald Trump, or did he break the seal? Did he break the glass? And so, like a guy like Aaron Rodgers, and I'm not advocating for Aaron Rodgers. I mean, I don't, I don't know near enough about what he thinks. But like, he's famous. He's waded into some big issues. I mean, like, do you think we'll see more of these? So, I don't know who it'd be, Bobby, like The Rock. Like we, I had, well, we had The Rock right here on the Will Cain show, and we asked him specifically, "Would you run yeah. president?" And the reaction, I see Andrew smiling. The reaction is almost always like that. But that was the reaction towards Donald Trump, too, for like half a decade. On late night shows, they'd ask him, and everybody laughed, oh, that can't be real. That's, And so we're going to do that to everybody. That can't be real. But I'm curious, is there somebody else? I don't know. Tony Robbins, another guest, friend of the Will Cain Show. Um, the Rock, whoever, that can come in like Donald Trump and represent a separation from the binary choice.
Well, and let's classify where Aaron Rodgers falls on the political spectrum, because this is pretty fascinating, because the legacy media will be like, oh, he's some conspiratorial right-wing kook. Not really. He actually represents, excuse me, what Elon Musk is, what Joe Rogan is, which is former Obama supporters who have grave concerns about the trajectory of American culture and COVID opened their eyes. Um, Aaron Rodgers is not a conservative. He's technically not a liberal at this point, but that's what Elon Musk is. That's what Joe Rogan is. That's what sometimes Glenn Greenwald and Matt Tabibi represent. That's a movement that should not be underrated. Now, who can be the face of that movement? That's another question. But there's a lot of Americans, including Clay Travis, the founder of OutKick, who used to vote Democrat and then between 2016 and now are so politically discontent with the Democratic Party that they have changed their affiliation. Um, So I think that there's more Americans than we realize that fall in the category Mm -hmm. of Aaron Rodgers who are not traditional GOPers, but don't believe in how institutions have progressed. Uh, The reason I was smiling when you brought up The Rock is I I don't think you should underestimate professional wrestlers. If uh, if, if not for the technicality that you have to be a natural born citizen of the United States to run for president, I think that Arnold Schwarzenegger would be president or would have had a very, very good shot at being president. Uh, People that are clearly capable of dedication and willpower can see a market opportunity by going into wrestling and then learn an intuitive ability to be theatrical are are very powerful Mm -hmm. players. So if The Rock wanted to be a politician, I think he'd be very good at it. Uh, I think that politics has changed in several fundamental ways, although I think that Trump is probably more symptomatic than instigatory when it comes to that. Um, one of the things you bring up, Bobby, uh, that, that I think is very much correct is that the the two major parties are not the, the sum total anymore. They right. used to be large parties. So pre-Trump, really, really more in the the up up till about like 2000 or so, um, you had a lot of conservative Democrats and you had Rockefeller Republicans, liberal Republicans. And both of those camps have pretty much died out. They're very, very small now to the point where in 1990, independents represented like, I don't know, maybe 20 percent of the electorate. And now independents are about half of the electorate. So a tremendous amount of people that might reliably vote Democrat or vote Republican do not want to affiliate with either party. And so there is a very big opportunity Mm -hmm. to reach people that are not being catered to by the establishment. I think some of the things that you're probably going to see moving forward are the way that we select presidents has changed. It's kind of flopped. So the Republicans used to have a very orderly seniority based system. Whoever was runner up becomes the next guy. So uh, Romney loses to McCain. He's the guy. But McCain lost to Bush. He's the guy. And so Republicans had this very orderly system and Democrats loved the king killer. They loved the shot in the dark that's going to change everything. So they they what they loved to do was have uh, Hillary Clinton come up and she's clearly going to take it. And then Barack Obama out of nowhere and like the wheel of time is broken and this time it's different. And they, they loved that. And they've now flipped. They're now the the lineup party. And so that dynamic's probably going to change. And then the other dynamic, which I would love to revert back, but seems to be part and getting worse of our politics is uh, prior to 2016, most voters voted in favor of a candidate. Now voters vote against a candidate. So you go back to Mm -hmm. Obama versus Romney. Um, People, for the most part, voted for Romney because they liked Romney or voted for Obama because they liked Obama. Now people do it because they hate Joe Biden or they hate Donald Trump. And we're we're voting out of antipathy. And that seems to be something that has changed and and is increasing. That's really good. Really good. Yeah, what you speak Um, of is I do, really quick, the wrestling point, like if we were ranking sports, this is kind of like Aaron Rodgers' point. Um, if you're ranking sports on who would put you on the best platform to run for president, I don't know that you could beat wrestling. Like football players don't have theatrics and performance down. Basketball players right. at least have their like face known. Don't they, they at least have their face known to America? Like I think wrestling probably is number one. And and yeah, they're going to beat rest- out actors because. This is like this happens every couple of years, like George Clooney will flirt with running for president or something. The, the deal is politics is actually really grueling. 
You got to wake up at six o'clock in the morning and go shake hands at the Elks Lodge breakfast. And you got to do it every day right. for months and months and months. And so I think a lot of actors in L.A. that like the idea of like, you know, I've conquered Hollywood. I would like to go to D.C. and have everyone adore me. And then they're like, OK, you got to go ask for money every 20 minutes for the rest of your life. They go. Or I could just be mm. in Hollywood. Whereas those guys that are like, you know, I, I wake up and I do a hundred crunches and then I I lift a thousand pounds that are like used to just having these grueling existences that are based on a light at the end of the tunnel. They're well situated for that kind of lifestyle. Right. Yeah. And politics is so much like wrestling, right? Where you have the good guys, the baby faces, the bad guys, the heels. And no matter what, you pretty much just cater to your side which is so much what we're seeing. But in some ways, that group I just mentioned, the Aaron Rodgers group, they don't always do that. They're sometimes politically inconvenient and unpredictable. I think mm. there's a market for that. And I'm going to go back to your point about, that's what I call the lesser of two evils phenomenon. And look, we heard that so much in 2016. Some people voted for Trump because they thought he was the lesser of two evils. And you have to wonder, does that eventually break where people say, I'm not going to vote against someone anymore. I'm going to vote for who I like. And maybe that elevates a third party to not winning the election, but having a bigger impact than a lot of previous ones. All right. I want to get to two other things with you guys today. First of all, I want to I want to talk about Don Lemon. I mean, we have to talk about Don Lemon. So, OK, Don Lemon does an interview last week after reportedly making a deal with X where he is going to exclusively post his contact content onto X. His first um, order of business is to interview Elon Musk. That that interview is granted. Apparently it goes horrifically. It's um it's a horrific first date. And um, uh, Elon Musk says that he is not gonna sign a contract with Don Lemon for exclusive content. Lemon's still free to post his content on X, but he's not going to be exclusive and he's not going to be a paid, I don't know, content provider for X. But in the in the process, and let me tell you guys something. Like, I know Don a little bit, and I I, I we we're not friends. We, we you know I, I think I've told this to, we're we're not friends. Okay, I actually ran into him <laughs> at a bar in New York recently, and the time that I saw him before that, we had to be physically separated. Um, but, uh, so when I say this, understand that's my background. Don Lemon's contract demands to X are so absurd that I, it starts to make me like him again. <laughs> like, I'm sorry, <laughs> like, it's so stupid that it makes me go, that's a good one, Don. Like, he asked for $5 million guaranteed, an $8 million contract a year. He asked for equity in X. He asked for a private flight, this is according to the New York Post, to Vegas, a day of drink, day drinking, massages for he and his partner, all as part of his deal to do a three times a week, 30-minute show on X. That's so entitled and ridiculous that I'm like, good on you, Don Lemon. <laughs> Bobby? No, no. Uh, excuse me, I have a cold. You're misreading this, Will. <laughs> His demands were purposely so outrageous because he wanted Elon Musk to cancel him because Don Lemon got so much pushback for teaming with Elon Musk. And what's happening now, now that he's branding himself as the guy who exposed Elon Musk, he's back on CNN. He's back doing these popular podcasts. This is the best thing for Lemon within his circles to force Elon Musk to terminate that contract before it actually ever began. I think it was so astute and wise on his part. Uh, I, I hadn't heard that absolutely before. So crib, crib this in my that was life. Back in December. Many times I've been fired. I'm going to claim that was a stupid strategy that I put in place on purpose. Yeah. I like <laughs> Um, I, by, by the way, serious. maybe Bobby's right, Andrew. Happened. Like, <clears throat> he, are you are you giving us analysis, or you are are you reporting that's what's happened? He he made these ridiculous demands in order to have the contract fail. No, I'm just my that's just my read from it. I don't have any um, sources on it, but I just he's loving okay. this, right? He's the most viral well, and newsworthy he's been since CNN canned him. He did that video walking down the streets of New York saying. Elon Musk is not this free speech absolutist. You have Jamel Hill now campaigning for CNN to rehire him because he exposed <laughs> Elon Musk. This worked out very well for Don Lemon. Um, him being fired this time was pretty strategic. 
This is Bobby Verak, the wrestling fan, Andrew. What you're hearing right here is this was all a work. And um, I'm telling you, he's a big wrestler. Bobby's a big wrestling fan. And I'm not telling him he's wrong. Like, well, I will say Lemon is very good at manipulating the public discourse. Like, you know, he's uh, – this is a real hole in my game. Like, I got to figure out how to start thinking two or three chess moves ahead on these things. Um, I'm, I'm totally inhibited by this whole being real thing, you know. Yeah. So um, everything's pro real. wrestling, Will. I mean, uh, everything's Don pro Lemon, wrestling. Look, is there a, a market for authenticity? He signed with Elon Musk. He was a bad guy. Now he's a good guy. We call that a face turn. <laughs> wow. Uh, I, I, okay. Uh, well, here's the thing, Andrew. I'm gonna put this to you really quickly. Yeah. Then it's awesome because. This does not – like those contract demands, it, they, it surprised me zero, zero that Don Lemon would ask for those things. <laughs> so this is great. So I get to be the, the, the kingmaker here. Option one is Don Lemon is a, a strategic genius. Option two is Don Lemon has an ego the size of a solar system. And I got to pick here. Right. Oh, I, <laughs> I, Will, I hate to do this to you. I, Bobby's made a convincing case. And the, the bit that I'll add, the, the bit that seemed to me to be a little bit disjointed here is using Elon Musk as the kickoff interview. Um, if, if you listen to Elon Musk on Rogan, I, Elon Musk is a, a hyper intelligent guy, but he's not a charismatic speaker. He's a very like level, right. very, like he's, it would be a difficult interview. So like, I would love it if he came on my show, the political orphanage, but it would be a, it'd be tough. Like, like I, there's a reason that they it were trying to get him high on Rogan using that as your kickoff. If you're a veteran interviewer is a very interesting choice. Like if, if you're going in, you want to do a softball interview with somebody that you already have rapport that, you know, is going to be really fun and engaging. And so the fact that he selected Elon Musk tells me that there was a strategic move there rather than just making content. All right. I want to move to this final story. It's a serious story, but it's important. Um, and, it, and it requires us to talk about it. In full context. And I'm going to give some background on my thoughts on this kind of thing for a second. So Bobby will know this about me. This this was a particularly um, – this style of story really, quite honestly, was in the top three that made me the most mad when I was doing sports media. So what would happen is the minute that a athlete reaches his apex, be it the Major League Baseball All-Star Game, MVP, or top pick in the NFL draft, um, I don't know – self-styled Pulitzer Prize winning seeking journalists would dig back through that athlete's tweets or history and they'd go back as far as when he was like a 13 or 14 year old and they'd come up with stuff that was objectionable. They did it to Kyler Murray, they did it to Josh Allen, they did it to, oh, I feel like it was a brewer at the Major League Baseball All-Star Game. They've done it over and over and over. <laughs> and it's grotesque. To me, it's not just, like, it's it's it really is grotesque because it's adults morally crusading on the backs of children and using old stuff as evidence of how someone grows as a human being. But I don't think, I think this idea that, you know, we're moral because we were better than we were 200 years ago is only more odious. It's only slightly less odious than we're moral because we're better than a 13 year old. Like this is really, really vile stuff to me. Now that I need to say that, but also say what I'm the story I'm about to hear for to share with you is very, very vile behavior from some 13 or 14 year olds. Okay. Condemnable, vile behavior allegedly taking place in Massachusetts. Uh, this is a story according to NBC 25 in Boston. Uh, I think it's NBC. It's News 25 in Boston. Um, six eighth graders have been criminally charged for their alleged roles in using Snapchat to set up a mock slave auction and direct hateful and racist comments towards black students. So says the district attorney last Thursday. The students are 13 and 14 years old. And they apparently set up this mock slave auction, said horrible racist things, vile behavior from these 13 or 14 year olds. I, I think everyone, I don't want to speak for either of you, but I I'm, feel fairly safe that not only both of you, but me and everybody listening and watching would go, that's horrific. They set up a mock slave auction. That's horrible. But I also think that is a parenting problem. First of all, those parents need to do some long looks in the mirror and ask themselves how they're doing with their children right now. But I think that also we have to understand that children make horrible choices and decisions as they work on becoming adults, 
right? And this is, I look, there's a certain segment of the media that says, oh, you're back ending what, I didn't do anything like this. I don't have anything to hide. But I know that children are children. And that's the thing. And what I can't get over is that there's a district attorney champion on, you know, by condemning these children. This district attorney, I mean, of course he's verbally, rhetorically condemning it as he should. By the way, the kids have been suspended from school. That's appropriate, suspended from school. But he's charging these kids. He's charging them. Um, I was trying to pull up the charges. It's interference with civil rights. You have it there, Andrew? It's interference Uh, with civil rights. Interfering with civil rights and threatening, threatening to do a criminal act. Yes. Now, these are words, right? So there is a whole First Amendment thing. Like, first of all, like free speech requires us not to prosecute criminally vile speech. Like, unless, I know the line, it's Brandenburg, the Supreme Court decision Brandenburg. It's direct incitement of violence. These kids, we can condemn, and we should condemn, and we can also go, whoa, you're charging them for vile speech? I'll turn it over to you, Andrew. I think you're absolutely right. I think that we're talking about two phenomena here. One is, is the speech itself um, something that we ought to condemn? The answer is yes. Uh, the the ele- other element is, is it criminal? The answer is a very hard no. Um, uh, what what this DA is doing, and I, I tried to do research on this uh, uh, in prep for the show, Will. Like I went to the DA's website. I went through the press releases. Um, there, I, I couldn't find the actual laws that he was citing. And so left with the, the stories that we have that are just coming from local media outlets, it very much appears that the DA has said, I am prosecuting racists for being racist. That's what he's doing. Is he he's identified um, kids that have, as you eloquently put, they're they're saying odious things that ought to have social consequences within the school and within their family, and he is taking it to a criminal level and saying that we are prosecuting racism. Now, racism is really bad. We sh- it is something that should be socially condemned. But in the United States, for very very good reason, based on I don't know all of global history for all time. We've figured out that when you give government the ability to condemn opinions, it is going to absolutely turn around and misuse those. And it's going to restrict the opinions to that which helps the government. And so we very, we've very rightly had a, a robust free speech uh, regime put in place in our country where you can say odious things and you will deal with the social consequences of it, but the state is not going to prosecute you for that. And this is a great example of that. Uh, the, the kids are saying yeah. dumb stuff. One would hope that they will learn from this and and we can you know rehabilitate them and they'll be they'll they won't do it again. I, I don't want to like ruin these kids' lives. Um, I, I want to put them in the right direction. But the the, the criminal element of this is a. a, a a kind of nascent authoritarian impulse, which is you don't deal with speech by good speech. You deal with speech by treating it like a virus and lancing it and cutting it out. And and that is a, a an authoritarian, intolerant way of looking at the world. And the, the, the way to handle this is what the ACLU was doing back in the day of like literal Nazis wanted to walk through Skokie, Illinois, which was a Jewish neighborhood with multiple residents that had survived the Holocaust. It could not be more offensive than that. And the ACLU, which much like Will here, was going, we agree this is horrible. This is absolutely horrible. But it is legally their right to do it. You don't get to restrict what people say and do based on how odious you find it. You get to restrict it if it's a direct incitement of violence, if it's if it's uh, you, you, there can be legal consequences for fraud, uh, for for things like that. But if it's an if it's an opinion which is odious, you can do that. Um, I, I it, this yeah. is a very weak case based on what I've seen of threatening criminality as if they were truly going to hold a slave auction and therefore we are going to preemptively charge them for something they did not do, which clearly they couldn't do anyway. That's that's a very weak way of going, we're going to prosecute somebody for being racist. Yeah, And, this and then, Bobby, there's the cultural the angle. The cultural angle, the fact that they were 13 and 14 years old. That doesn't forgive them, but it should factor in, like, in wisdom, using wisdom— Set aside the free speech angle, I, 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 just for a moment, I'm saying, just set aside the free speech angle. Um, I, I just don't know about a society that that takes a 13 or 14 year old and says, "Okay, the district attorney is after you for your mistakes." They're ba- they're terrible mistakes. And by the way, I feel really bad for the kids that they were doing this to and about. That that needs to be said as well. But I just don't know about a society and a culture that morally preens on the backs of children. Yeah, and I think this further establishes the fear people have of where speech crimes are punished more 
thoroughly than violent crimes, right? Like if these kids would have came to blows at recess, we wouldn't even know about this story. The district attorney would have never gotten involved, but because it's a supposed speech crime, which it sounds like it technically is, it's become this big issue where their lives might be ruined forever. And like I, I echo everything you guys said there. And it just comes down to such a dangerous precedent where we let these district attorneys decide what is and is not racism or a, even a hate crime, right? A lot of this stuff tends to be subjective and history always shows that it repeats itself or even rhymes and it becomes weaponized and abused and it just gives the people in power even more power over us. That can't happen. Yeah. Well, Bobby Burak, he's a writer at OutKick. Again, culture, politics, media, and sports. Check him out, Burak Bobby on X. And Andrew Heaton, he hosts The Political Orphanage, as you heard it mentioned just a moment ago, and Adults Are Talking with Andrew Heaton on Free the People. And find him on X at Mighty Heaton. You guys were awesome. Thank you guys so much for doing this today. It's been fun talking with you here on The Will Cain Show. Thanks for having Appreciate us. It. Like your new tan, Will. <laughs> It'll last for another week or two. Appreciate it. <laughs> Um, all right. One of the things I missed over spring break was NFL free agency and the Cowboys get an F and it's an F that I'm afraid sets them up for a future. That's an F that's coming up next on the Will Kane show. All of your favorite Fox News podcasts ad free on Apple Podcasts with Fox News Podcasts Plus. From Trey Gowdy, the Fox News Rundown, Will Cain, Brian Kilmeade, and so much more. Go to foxnewspodcasts.com for all the details. The Fox News Rundown, a contrast of perspectives you won't hear anywhere else. Your daily dose of news twice a day. Featuring insight from top newsmakers, reporters, and Fox News contributors. Listen and subscribe now by going to foxnewspodcasts.com. It's dimly lit. He's dressed in black. He's holding a knife in his right hand. Four gruesome murders. This is going to be the social media murders. Three Fox Nation originals. The evidence that's come out is very compelling. One suspect. Who is Brian Koberger? Mark Furman hosts three exclusive specials you can only find on Fox Nation. Delve into the Idaho College Murders, Digital Shadows, Savage Instincts, and Moscow Murders. All streaming now, only on Fox Nation. I'm Dana Perino, and this is Perino on Politics. Dana Perino, co-host of The Five and co-anchor of America's Newsroom, returns to Fox News Audio with a brand new podcast, Perino on Politics. Listeners of Everything Will Be Okay will be thrilled by the return of a familiar voice, but with a fresh spin as Dana guides audiences through the 2024 election cycle. Make sure you subscribe to this series wherever you download podcasts and leave a rating and review. Coming up tomorrow on The Will Cain Show, the host of Jesse Waters Primetime, Jesse Waters, hangs out with us for, I don't know what he'll give us, half hour, 45 minutes, with Jesse Waters. On The Will Cain Show, streaming live at foxnews.com, the Fox News YouTube channel, the Fox News Facebook page, always on demand at Apple, Spotify, or Fox News Podcast. Hit subscribe. And then if you want to catch up on exclusive contents, we're two months into the Will Cain show, and we have various features and segments like Off the Rails with Pete Hegseth or Lunch Break Panels like we just had with Bobby Burke and Andrew Heaton. You can go over to YouTube and hit Will Cain Show. It's under the f description of this live feed right now, and hit subscribe. And you can get previous interviews with Dave Portnoy or Tony Robbins or The Rock, or you can get any of those featured segments like Off the Rails by subscribing to The Will Cain Show. Last week was the kickoff of NFL free agency. Now, I have become a firm believer that you don't win the Super Bowl by winning free agency. And in fact, you can probably find a negative correlation to the teams that do win free agency often do not set themselves forward on a good step towards winning the Super Bowl. Free agency is like going to the store and buying the most expensive items when you can wait after the insanity calms down and get something maybe not quite as good, but 70% of the value for 30% of the cost. And as a fan of Warren Buffett, of value investing, of not being a big spender myself, I've appreciated teams 
quite honestly, like the Dallas Cowboys, who've seen the light when it comes to free agency. Ever since the 1990s, after the Deion Sanders purchase, Jerry Jones seems to have understood that you don't win the Super Bowl by winning free agency. The problem is he hadn't won a Super Bowl. But the team has been consistently better. The Dallas Cowboys usually shop on day three, four, the second week of free agency, and they get good buys, and they've had a good history of bringing in players like J. Ron Curse or Malik Hooker, whatever it may be, at a much better and cheaper value than who is signed on day one and day two. This year, that's guys like Saquon Barkley or Kirk Cousins. But the problem for the Dallas Cowboys is they have completely sat out free agency pretty much all together and done nothing but lost players. And there's a reason for that. Because their cap situation is terrible. They can, simply can't afford it. And that's a concern. They're paying so much money for Dak Prescott. They need to restructure Dak Prescott. They need to resign Dak Prescott. They need to do that in part just to free up cap money. But that cap money is going to have to go to signing the guys that are already on the Dallas Cowboys, like C.D. Lamb or Micah Parsons. And those are important players, better than anybody you're going to get in free agency. You've got to keep those guys in-house, which means you're going to have to pay top dollar, which means you're going to have to figure out your cap situation, and it's going to keep you from signing guys from the outside. It's going to put more pressure on the draft. But the Cowboys are probably looking at a situation where they need five starters, and they're going to find five starters in the draft. They had to say goodbye to Hall of Famer Tyron Smith, Hall of Fame left tackle. Now, here's the most concerning thing for me. The Cowboys have three straight years of 12 and 5. That's incredible. That's an incredible run. That is one of the best in the NFL. And if you look at runs in the NFL, they don't last that long. They last three, four, maybe five years. The best teams that establish dynasties reinvent those teams on three to five year cycles around a franchise player. Almost every New England Patriots Super Bowl looked different but for Tom Brady. You have to have a quarterback at that level and then revolve around that. That's somewhat you're seeing with Patrick Mahomes and the Kansas City Chiefs. There's no Tyree kill anymore. They've had to change out running backs. They've changed out the entire wide receiver core. The only consistency out of Mahomes, really, outside of Mahomes, has been Travis Kelsey. And guess what? Travis Kelsey ain't going to be long for the Kansas City Chiefs. But that dynasty will roll on around Mahomes as long as you have a guy like that. Otherwise, you get stuck in purgatory of the Minnesota Vikings, paying top dollar for Kirk Cousins, which puts together a good team for the Vikings. Year after year, winning record, playoffs, one round, maybe two, and out. And that's become the story of the Dallas Cowboys. Your window was the last three years, 12 and 5. And that got you one round into the playoffs and out. And now what I'm worried about is you're seeing the closure of that window. Now, what do you reinvent it around? I think we all have some, and I love him, but I have some healthy skepticism around Dak Prescott. Can you do it around a defensive player like Micah Parsons? Can you reinvent? Is he Lawrence Taylor? Can you reinvent over and over and over around one guy on defense? Is he influential enough? Quarterback by very definition, influential, and he has the ball in his hands. And what I'm telling you is, while the Dallas Cowboys get an F in free agency this year, because not only are they not, they're not just value shopping, they're not shopping at all because they can't afford to. And that's a product of the fact that their future is set up. What it looks like to me, their future is set up as a failure, as an F. I think Tinfoil Pat, young establishment James, and two-a-days Dan uh, want me to put up a poll. Who's had the worst free agency? Bills. I don't even know who else is on it because it doesn't matter. You know who's had the worst free agency? And it's not close. The Dallas Cowboys. All right, that's going to do it for me today here on The Will Kane Show. I'll see you again tomorrow. Remember, tomorrow, Jesse Waters, the host of Jesse Waters Primetime, hangs out on The Will Kane Show. I'll see you next time.